Matthew chapter 6. I want to invite us to read Matthew 6, remembering that we're kingdom citizens. I've really enjoyed the Olympics for a lot of reasons uh, over this past couple of weeks. One of the things that the Olympics always stirs in me is this great sense that the world's a lot bigger than I remember sometimes, and yet it's a lot smaller at the same time. I've enjoyed noticing how many different athletes were born in one country, and yet they're now citizens of another country, and they are coached by yet another country. <laughs> and you see, particularly in the ice arena, so many of these figure skating coaches switching jackets and switching jackets and switching jackets. And there's a great statement of unity in that as well, if you think about it. Sure, it's competition, but I love seeing those athletes pulling for each other. I mean, didn't you get emotional when that Canadian pair won the ice uh, dancing and, and they were just so emotional? And it, I don't know, she'd been in the Olympics for 20 years, never got a gold. Do you know what I'm talking about? Germany. Oh, that's correct. Yeah, I can picture them. It's not Canada. Maybe they had a Canadian coach. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they were Germany. I know, they were Germany. My favorite, though, is Mame Baini, a short track speed skater born in Ghana, representing the United States and representing us so well with that smile. <laughs> I just loved uh, that and her, her tweet about, uh, you know, why do you smile so much? And it's not because life is perfect, but it's because I'm remembering that God has given so much. And uh, just thankful for that. And I need that reminder often that there is a bigger picture around us going on all the time. And as we've been thinking about the kingdom of God, and as Matthew refers to it as the kingdom of heaven, the last few Sundays, I hope that we can do that. I hope that we can recognize that if we think that this world is complex and there are many details and there are many uh, interconnected relationships and, and so forth over the globe that we know nothing about, I think that we're challenged to remember that Jesus Christ is king right now. His kingdom has begun. So the future is already. Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of God is near. And so Jesus rules around us all the time at this moment. And there's so much more to life than just life. There's so much more to our daily decisions and the way we conduct ourselves and the way that we are a church or the way that we are a family or the way that we are a married couple, on and on and on, or the way that we are as parents or grandparents. There's so much more to that than just what we think and what we see. I don't know about you, but I, I loved having Dan White on the piano today nicely done and there he is holding his son Ian <laughs> and I'm thinking when our son Kyle was Ian's age Danny White hung the moon <laughs> and he'd be up here playing drums uh, as a teenager and, and uh, on into young adulthood and Kyle just couldn't wait to get up here just march his way up here and find those sticks he wanted to be just like <laughs> just like Dan in every way and and you know who we were as a church 15, 20 years ago, is significant. Uh, Dan, if you don't know, is a very active member of Greenleaf Friends Church. We see him all the time at Main Camp. And, uh, and he's a joyful participant in their leadership. And we don't always see the effect of, of what we're invested in in the moment. But I want to assure you that Jesus does. And, it, and it's a bigger picture. And it, and it blesses not just us or our neighborhood or our world, but it, but it blesses for generations and generations to come. So I'm just, I'm just grateful for a bigger picture today. And I want to challenge us to read Matthew 6 as kingdom citizens, as people who remember the importance of the bigger picture of things. We're dual citizens, by the way, aren't we all? No matter what continent you were born on or what country, you're, you're a dual citizen if you're a believer in Christ in the kingdom of God and this world at the same time. Um, the bigger context of Matthew 6, and oh boy, Matthew 6. Matthew 6. It's one of my all-time favorite passages. I find myself coming back to it over and over and over again because I consider myself a gold medalist at worry. <laughs> and, and I need Jesus' words all the time saying, Ken, the world's a lot bigger than you. By the way, it's a lot smaller than you too. See that bird over there and the lilies and all that? I take care of all that stuff, so quit worrying. And I, it's just one of my favorite passages. So I'm going to read the tail end of Matthew 6, but I want us to think about it as a whole chapter, so I'm going to give you a running start. Would you stand with me as you're able? 
Check this out in Matthew 6. This is the major context of Matthew 6 is have integrity. So in, in verse 1 of Matthew 6, Jesus said, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So be careful. Just do this for your Father and nobody else. And then verse 5 is similar. When you pray, so in the first place, when you practice your acts of righteousness generally, but when you pray, that's a good thing to do, right? When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. And then verse 16, be different as kingdom citizens than just the, the religion of this world. When you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they're fasting. <laughs> Truly, I tell you, they've already received all their attention and their reward in full. And now from verse 19 to the end of the chapter, um, Jesus, oh, oh, verse 19, we're not quite there, verse 19. Don't store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy. Don't have a divided interest, have integrity, be kingdom citizens, not worried about this world. Watch this, because no one can serve two masters. Here's the context of this whole thing. This is about allegiance. Are you trying to impress others or are you trying to build your security on earth? Either you'll hate the one and love the other or you'll be devoted to the one and you'll despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Does anybody need to hear that today? What a big statement. <laughs> what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear, is not life more important than food, and after all, the body more important than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. What a great day in February we have. Sunshine and everything. We can actually do this. There might be birds out there. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Even bigger. Can any of you, by worrying at a single hour, to your life? It's rhetorical. The answer is no. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. Now that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith, so don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, that seems like such a harsh term to us. But those outside of faith, it's a different context in the first century. They run after all these things, and yet your heavenly Father, he already knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. May God give us the grace to be present to the kingdom of God today. Amen? Please be seated. I do want to tackle the whole Matthew 6 chapter because I think it's integrated. It, it's all together. It's really saying one thing if we think about it. And I'm going to use a couple different words to try to put that across. Integrity and intensity. Jesus is talking about our temptation to get too attached to this world and to serve two masters, specific to the context of money there. But, but with regard to giving and fasting and praying and our acts of service, we're just concerned that other people will notice rather than just doing this for God. It's about integrity, and it's also about intensity. I'm just going to close with a couple of remarks about finding integrity by, by having intensity. So let me start with integrity. And I'm talking about what it looks like to have a life where kingdom is first. Integrity. A lot of people wrongly assume, if you don't know this, that an apple that does not have a mark where a worm might have penetrated it, therefore does not have a worm inside of it. This is such a comforting thought. Going to make, this is going to make you rush out and eat an apple after this service. D. 
Did you know that is not always true? An apple blossom on the tree, that's open, it doesn't have the skin on it yet, creates an ideal environment for insects to lay their eggs. You know where this is going. Having laid an egg in the blossom, don't you love nature? They, 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 they need to live too, these bugs. The precious new life then hatches in the heart of the apple, shielded and protected from the environment. And by the way, there's a wonderful food source <laughs> for this cute baby little worm as it eats its way through the center of the apple. <laughs> Someone's compared sin to the worm in the apple. It starts there in the heart. When you think of purity or integrity, as I talk about integrity in the kingdom, I want you to think about apples. Because the case for all of us is simply, we are not always what you see is what you get. And, and we tend to want to judge things by outward appearances. We all want to know if an apple is safe to eat, <laughs> right? But we don't necessarily know that by looking at the outside of a person. A pure apple, of course, is one with no worms inside of it. A good apple is, is a wonderful source of protein just because you're eating the apple, not the worm also, right? <laughs> Purity. Jesus calls us to have purity. Integrity, of course, is being the same on the inside as we are on the outside. So let me offer this heartwarming message as we continue forward. A heart of integrity, a pure heart, is three things. One, it is constantly aware of God's presence. And this is the call to kingdom living, to give Jesus control of every single corner of our life. The kingdom of God isn't just the future, of course. It's already here. We are to enter into the lordship of Jesus today. We're to be present to him today. We're not just to wait for someday at the end of our lives or after retirement or after the kids leave home or something. We're not to put it on hold. Jesus reigns today. And, and he longs for us to very practically give him our daily decisions. And that's been our focus the last few weeks. We're living our lives in full view of the king. A key to understanding Matthew 6 is to notice the repetition. Three times in Matthew 6, three times, Jesus offers this statement that the Father sees what is done in secret. And members of the kingdom don't just judge life by outward appearances. They remember that the God who is unseen sees everything. So God is able to see the shiny skin of the apple and the core of the apple at the same time. So does that make us more comfortable today sitting in the pews or less comfortable today <laughs> sitting in the pews? Knowing that God understands the motives of the heart, God knows the feelings, God knows the thoughts, God knows the intentions even better than we do. We can't hide our worms from God. We don't have to. Jesus longs to break into this messy world full of sin on the inside and outside and to redeem us and to allow us to move forward. So, we have no secrets from God. And we're called to live with that awareness. That's integrity. Two, living into integrity, kingdom first, means my heart is content with God's praise. And this is Jesus' focus through this whole first half of Matthew chapter 6. Is it enough that God knows you did a good thing? Is that enough for you? Or is there something in you that just really needs somebody else to notice and to say, good job, <laughs> and to pat you on the back or write you a check <laughs> or, or say thank you in, in, in some way or another? We're kingdom citizens, but we're also citizens of this world. And there's something in our humanness that, that just really longs for attention. And so Jesus points this out to the Pharisees. And he talks about all of their deeds of righteousness, how they give to the poor, how they fast, and how they pray. And he says, the problem is, he calls them hypocrites, which is a term that means actor. You're just putting on a show for everybody else to see. Also repeated three times in Matthew 6 is not only the fact that God sees it all, but God rewards it. So, so... God sees everything that you've done in secret, 
and he will reward what is done in secret. And after all, which reward would we rather have? Would we rather have the blushing and gushing of the crowd, or would we rather have Jesus being able to fulfill his purposes and being pleased with us? It's no contest, because one's so temporary. If you doubt that, do something great for somebody, and then next week see if they even remember it. <laughs> it's, it's just life. It's so temporary. But your father, who sees what is done in secret, you know, by the way, all this kingdom stuff and this kingdom talk is so big. It, it really begins at home, don't you think? I mean, if these things aren't true in our relationships with the people that are closest to us, it's probably not working anywhere. Somebody said, if it doesn't work at home, don't export it, right? <laughs> think about the kingdom with regard to marriage, even. A simple thing such as that. You know, as husbands, sometimes... We'll do a wild thing, and, and, and we'll just do something kind for our spouse. Maybe for you, it's washing the bathroom or something grand like that. And, and what I notice for me anyway, I'm sure I don't speak for any other husbands, is I notice that when I do that, I'm just waiting, waiting, waiting for her to see it and notice and say something. Am I right? Then you just, oh, she's got, she's going to see that. She's, and what happens when that doesn't happen right away? Most of the time with the wife, she knows it right away. I can walk by something for a week and not see it. Ah, she spots it right away. And sometimes I wonder about my motivation in those circumstances. Why do I have to spoil it? I did it because I love. I, I did it because I care. And yet there's this human side of me that needs a gold medal. <laughs> I need to be honored and put on a platform because I did this simple act of service. Why is that? See, if this stuff doesn't work in our, most, uh, in our closest, most intimate relationships, I don't know if it works anywhere, anywhere else at home. Because I know Jesus is talking to people in the context of the synagogue, and, and they're giving with trumpets, and they want everybody to notice when the plate goes around and, and so forth. I get it, but I think this applies on every level. Do we do what we do because we're kingdom citizens? Do we do what we do because we're following the lead of King Jesus? Saying, I've put it in your heart to bless that person, and I want you to do it. So when he talks about these things, he says, don't let your left hand even know what your right hand's doing. Don't you love that statement in Matthew 6? When you give, don't give with trumpets, but don't let your left hand even know. Do you know what that means? I'll show you what that means. Take, take both hands and interlock your fingers, and take notice. How many of you have your right thumb on top? Okay, how many of you have your left thumb on top? Wow, it's, it's kind of even. You know, anatomically, there's not really a reason necessarily that you put your right thumb over, but now reverse it, whichever way you were, reverse it. And let me just ask you, how does that feel? It's just wrong. What's going on with those left thumbers next to me anyways? It's just wrong. All that this is, is it's a habit. And you and I are creatures of habit. And so we're, our left hand doesn't even know what our right hand is doing when we casually fold our hands together. It's just, it's, it's just second nature. And I think this is what Jesus is after when he talks about learning to do acts of service in this world. When he talks about God's kingdom work being done on earth as it is in heaven, when he's talking about the reality of the kingdom, he wants it to be so ingrained on the inside that it just comes out naturally without even thinking. That we want to give out of a pure heart and that's the kind of giving that really releases God's power in this world, I'm convinced. You know, people know when you serve them and you're grumpy about it. <laughs> versus those who serve and it's just an absolute delight and an absolute joy are we content only with God's praise it has to do with the inner motives integrity the outward act is there and the inward heart is there too and then uh, so God knows and judges your motives and then third kingdom first means that my heart is centered around kingdom priorities and Jesus here is talking about putting the kingdom of God first. And I think 
I think I have a practical way for us to measure whether or not our hearts are centered around kingdom priorities. It sounds really good to say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. It sounds really good. Of course, that's me, you know, kingdom first. I'm a kingdom citizen, I get it. But in a practical way, I wanna give you a little test as to whether or not this is working in our lives. Because Jesus asked, asked the question, what do you worry about? And it's interesting to me that he connects this passage with this whole talk about integrity. He's talking about being single focused on the kingdom and letting Jesus have control. And I think a practical way to know if this is working out practically in my life is just to ask, what are the things that I happen to worry about? So Jesus says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here are, here are a list of five different things that we tend to focus on. Verse 19, I just read it, talks about our finances. Can, can any of us get beyond step one? <laughs> Does Jesus just already know <laughs> what it is, what we're sensitive about? <laughs> it, finances just don't seem to be a neutral topic for anybody, right? Why is that? Well, it's because Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart is also. Wait a minute, I don't like that. I don't want to look at the things that I do with my physical resources and somehow then be able to figure out whether or not my heart's really centered around the kingdom. I would rather separate those things, right? And say, well, you know, giving's just this thing over here and the kingdom's this thing over here. I think he's giving us an opportunity to have a barometer, a thermometer of our spiritual life. What, what's in the core that you can't see otherwise is coming out in outward things. Um, don't worry about food. Don't worry about your health, uh, fashion, impressing other people. Um, don't even worry about the future. I and mean, this is a hard list. But, but he's inviting us to measure whether or not our hearts lined up with kingdom priorities based on what's coming out. Don't worry. By the way, doesn't this sort of come across as like command language? Are you with me on that? Don't, don't we all think of don't sin as a minor sin versus some of the major sins? <laughs> There's no room for that. Either your heart is in line with the kingdom and the result will be that you will not worry or not. This is a tough test, by the way. I think it is too. <laughs> so we have some of the common things that we worry about. If I have a misplaced priority, I am going to worry. Someone's defined worry as practical atheism. Does this hurt enough? <laughs> I mean, it's so true. It means that I don't trust God in this area or that area, so I have to worry about it instead of give this over to the kingdom. You know, our natural thinking is that we need to be in control of life. So I want to turn the page here a little bit and think about intensity. So, so not just this, how are we doing with integrity, but intensity. Here's some things that I think we can do about it. And this doesn't get any easier. So I'm just going to throw out the first two points at first because they're, they're, they're tough. Okay? I think Jesus invi is inviting us to do two things. I think he's inviting us to let go of the myth of a balanced life. So I just want to make you throw your pen or something. <laughs> I've been after this balanced life all my life. I can't get there. <laughs> Let go of the myth of a balanced life and instead pursue a single, relentless focus. And Lord, help me. I want to try to explain this. You know, I'm like you. I, I look for balance in terms of my time and, and the competing things that are in my life. But as I read scripture, I notice something. It's really hard to find balance as a biblical idea. <laughs> I look at the Apostle Paul and I wonder what a time management consultant would have to say to the Apostle Paul. Hey Paul, that tent making is not making a great profit. I really think you need to invest a little less time in this being the Apostle to the Gentiles thing and all this travel that you're doing which is so expensive and you really need to invest in, 
in, in putting together a corporate plan for your tent making business. There's no balance in Paul's life. He says he was shipwrecked, he was flogged, he, he's given everything for the gospel. And ultimately he gives his life for it. And I think this is part of the tension that we all feel in this life, that, that we are earthly citizens in this sense, but we are kingdom citizens as well. Lord, help us to know what that looks like on a daily basis. You know, balance, by the way, it's something that, that is possible in nature, just as a scientific principle. Balance is when countervailing forces equal each other out. So balance is a pretty important thing to understand if you want to go scuba diving, for example. If you want to go scuba diving, you've got the pressure of the water that wants to push you to the bottom of the sea, but you also have oxygen in your tank, and you've got these packs that you can control how much oxygen goes into them as well. So you've got air, and you've got water. And, and balance in scuba diving is that magic balance between those two things where you're, you're just floating. Don't we all want that in life? We just want to feel no countervailing pressures. We want balance. And so we get into this thinking, when and then. You know, when these bills are paid off, I'm going to be floating. <laughs> When this relationship changes, or I get out of this circumstance, then, are you all guilty of that, by the way? When and then thinking? If you're not, we need to do a brain scan, because all of us struggle with this in this life. We want to balance countervailing forces. So, so in physics and in nature, it can happen. But you know what the thing is? It's impossible in nature for these countervailing forces to be sustained. It's possible to attain them, but it's impossible to sustain them. Why? Because everything's in motion. Life is still moving. Every, there, there are constant changing forces going on all the time. This is life. So as soon as you get one thing figured out in life, you go on to the next thing. And we drive ourselves crazy trying to figure out balance. You know what it means for me to be a godly parent today looks a lot different than what it meant for me to be a godly parent 15 years ago when my kids were little. It's a completely different investment of time. It's a completely different investment of energy. And yet, and yet I'm still a parent, and I want to be the best parent I can be, and I want to be a godly parent. It's just that life keeps changing. As soon as we get something figured out, and kids have mercy on us, because we tried. <laughs> we did the best we could as we would, and that's what you'll do too. <laughs> right? But there's no static point in life to where it's finally going to be balanced, and you're not going to have any pressure in life. What's important is to seek the kingdom now. And the only way to do that is to do that wholeheartedly. You know, when we hear the proposition of Jesus, come follow me, I think what we naturally want to do is like anything else, we want to control it. We, we, want, we want to be able to say, okay, I've got this priority of golf over here, <laughs> and I've got this priority of Jesus over here, and I need to find a balance. I know that that may seem like a trivial comparison. But what if it's career or moral decisions that interfere with your career and the and the morality of Jesus. I mean, there are bigger issues involved. What if I'm just too busy? How, how do we deal with this? And what I'm trying to say is, a call to follow Jesus, a call to accept kingdom citizenship, is a call to accept a king. And a king is not someone you balance your allegiance with. You're 100% the servant of the king. It's all about the king if you're part of a kingdom. It's different than our idea of I get to choose and I'm in control and I'm going to make things balanced to where it works. And the Pharisees tried to control religion. They tried to define what it is that you have to do in order to be appearing just right, etc., etc. He says, you missed the point. I'm after your hearts and I want your whole heart. I want everything that you are. 
because what Jesus is really after is a relationship with us. And I struggle, honestly, to know how best to convey Jesus' words. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and what does that really look like? And it doesn't look like a set of priorities. It's a relationship. We need to, we need to adjust our paradigm. And that's what Jesus came to do with the kingdom, right? He came to turn upside down our assumptions to help us think very differently about the world. And this is a different paradigm. A kingdom citizen. It's different than any other demand of your life. And I, and I struggle. How can, how, can, how can we understand that? How can we explain that? And, and the only thing I could come up with is that it is relationship. And so I can think about my own relationships. I'm a married man. So I, I, I wear this symbol, this ring, and I've worn it for 29 years. And, and to me, it's an important symbol. And that's not the main thing is the symbol. I, I get it. But to me, it's a symbol. And, and one thing that it just looks strange <laughs> not to have it on my finger. To me, it's a symbol. And something that it reminds me of is that I'm married everywhere I go. And it's not good enough to be a husband only when I'm at home. Or only insofar as Teresa is aware. Integrity as a husband means that she knows my heart inside and out, and I've got nothing to hide from her. It's relationship. There's no way to balance the priority of being married with any other priority that I have on this earth. It's just different. Being a husband affects every decision that I make. Being a child of God affects every decision that I make. Being a pastor affects every decision that I make. And there's no balance on these things. You know, if Teresa, and so here's the last thing. What we, what we really need to try to do then is to find a rhythm of what I'm going to call service and rest, balancing what we give out and what we take in. We need to find a rhythm of service and rest. And we can do that if we find the right center. If we're developing a relationship with Jesus to where we're hearing his voice, we can begin to develop the right center from which the flow of life will come. And the balance is going to continue to change in lots of different ways. We need to continue to do that in relationship with Jesus as a center, as, as a magnificent obsession, not as a balance. The shortest parable in Scripture is, is uh, in front of you, printed on your outlines. And it's the parable of the, the hidden treasure. And, and, it, and it says that, that a man discovered this treasure in a field that was hidden. And I probably have it printed somewhere. I don't know. Maybe I don't. There it is. Thank you. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went out and sold all he had and bought the field. There, there is no balance there. This guy is completely imbalanced. And this is the joy of the kingdom. And so I do compare that to my marriage. There's just nothing I wouldn't do for her. Nothing I wouldn't do. And, and, and so when I abandon her to work. <laughs> I do that with her blessing. We talked about those things. Those things we're on the same page about. That's what marriage is, right? <laughs> it's learning to reorient our lives in a totally different way. And in the same way, kingdom orientation is different as well. It's, it, it's, it's all encompassing. And, and I'm just putting this last point in to help us understand. Jesus doesn't call us to kill us in terms of our overcommitments and, 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 and stress and everything else. He says, come and follow me. Learn the rhythms of following me in my life. There are times that you will need to adjust the oxygen because of the pressure. In fact, there are times that you need to go to the surface and get your tank refilled. You need to get out of the pressure for a time to be refilled. You need to learn what season of life you're in, and you need to learn the rhythm of Jesus to be filled and to be giving all at the same time. But the issue is, is the kingdom your heart's passion? Is it everything to you? I believe as we relentlessly pursue the kingdom, as we put Jesus first, as, as we practice out of balance obsession 
many times being unfair to ourselves or other priorities. You've got to pick what's most important to you. Jesus says, I will take care of all the rest. It's so simple. I think I have to take care of it. I, have, and if, I mean, who's going to look out for me if it's not me? I've got to look out for my own interests. I've I got I to have enough. I've got to do enough. I've got to be enough. All these things that I worry about, my finance, my health, everything else. If I pursue the kingdom first, Jesus promises, I rule the universe. My invisible rule is all around this kingdom right now. Quit worrying. Don't give me a divided heart. Give me all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. I will take care of the rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would make us people of integrity and people of intensity. God, how I pray that you would indeed make us to be people who have nothing to run from and nothing to hide. Teach us to be people whose hearts are cut open and exposed. Teach us, Lord, to relentlessly pursue your goodness your control over our situations. Lord, when we feel so incredibly stressed, out of balance, out of whack, teach us, Jesus, to give you everything. Help us to refind you as our center. Lord, I pray for the men who will go to men's retreat this next weekend. Lord, have mercy on any who aren't sure if they should go. Maybe they should. God, maybe the busier we are, the more we need it. Lord, let this be a very special time for the men in our church to refine a center, to refocus on your kingdom as everything to us. And Jesus, as we do, we invite you to take care of our needs. Lord, as a whole church, I think of the many, many, many good things that we are able to be part of and able to do. Help us, Lord, to stay focused on your kingdom first. Help us to find the right rhythms of prayer and worship and waiting, studying your word, as well as serving and giving and doing. We invite you to be the one who establishes the work of our hands. We invite you to be the one who leads us beside the quiet still waters. In Jesus' name we pray.